The uh, participants in, tonight, in tonight's debate are uh, to my left, the petitioning candidate for first selectman of East Lyme, Wes Furman. And to my right, the incumbent Republican, Mark Nickerson. I'm Paul Charnier, the editorial page editor at the Day newspaper. Uh, we received quite a few questions emailed to me from uh, residents of East Lyme that uh, will help guide the questions I'll be asking in tonight's debate. We will not be taking any questions uh, directly from the audience, but I, I got a very good sampling of some of the issues uh, people were interested about uh, here in East Lyme. Um, we're going to begin uh, with uh, one minute opening statements from our candidates. Uh, and thereafter, we'll have a question and, and response debate uh, uh, from uh, the two candidates. So we had coin flips to, to begin, and we'll begin with uh, an opening statement from Mark. Thank you, Paul. Good evening. I'd like to begin tonight by thanking all those who came out tonight and are taking an active interest in the future of our town. Ensuring that East Lyme leadership works in the best interests of our citizens is very important. In fact, our town is great today because of the fine, experienced, dedicated first selectmen we have elected for decades. East Lyme is in a very, very enviable position. Our tax rates have remained low and steady. Our mill rate is lower than most towns in our region. Our schools are listed among the best in the state. Our beaches, walking trails, parks are beautiful and natural gifts that we all treasure. Our business community is thriving. To sum it up, East Lyme is in a good place. In fact, probably the best shape it's ever been in. I've been looking forward to this debate for a long time. I'm proud of our town. I stand ready to support our department heads and commissions on the fine work that they do. I love how our town has matured during the past 18 years. And I'm equally proud to say that I have been part of the town's success for almost two decades. Thank, Thank you. you. Wes? Yeah, and yeah, no applause during the debate. I should have mentioned that, uh, sorry, but uh, you'll have a chance at the end, but if no interruptions, we'd appreciate it. Wes? Thank you, Paul. Good evening. I would like to thank the New London Day for hosting and moderating our debate for First Selectman of East Lyme. Thank you to our audience for your attention tonight and taking an interest in the future of our town. My name is Wes Furman, and I am running for First Selectman of East Lyme on November 7th. I am 37 years old, a lifelong resident of East Lyme, I've been through our school systems. My daughter is currently in the Flanders School. I've purchased my home here, and I've helped to oversee my two family businesses in town, Northeast Financial Group and Furman's Garage. If elected, I've, I have made arrangements to take a leave of absence from both and focus my attention solely to the townspeople. Being first selectman and the leader of our town is not something that can be done by trying to live a dual professional life. I am here tonight because I have taken the time to listen to the townspeople. This is not the, the case with our current administration. Whether it be by my door-to-door -door encounters or out in front of Stop and Shop, many towns people feel their voice and opinions are not heard. We lack a leader who is truly there for us 100%. There is a sense of this us versus them mentality, and if you're not on board with the current team, you're unheard. Every citizen in our town has the right to be heard, regardless of what team you're on. Thank you. All right, with that, we'll begin the uh, question post of the debate. The, Candidate taking the question will have one minute uh, to respond. Uh, the other candidate will have uh, 90 seconds uh, to answer the question and voice any rebuttal they heard from the original answer, and then it goes back uh, to the person who took the question for 30 seconds to close out that question. Uh, by um, the discretion of the moderator, me, I can give people additional 30 seconds to bounce something back and forth if we're having any an exchange uh, of ideas. So we begin that, so 60 seconds, we begin uh, with Wes. Uh, does the rapid development of apartment and other housing pose a danger to the character of East Lyme and a strain on its services, or should this expansion be seen as progress? Well, Paul, that's a good and bad um, question. Yes, it is good for our town to have some more uh, apartment developments in this town so people can move here and rent if necessary before purchasing a home to see if they like our town. On the other hand, 
the more people that move into this town, whether it be renting or buying, um, that is more children we have to put in the school system. So we need to find a way to make that where it's uh, equally, um, equally adequate for our town's taxpayer. Uh, Mark? Rapid development of East Lyme. It's not rapid. It is growing. It's a desirable town. It's a desirable town because we have relatively low taxes and we have some of the best school systems in the area. People do want to move here. Um, we, ha we have a thriving business community, the new dentist office, the new orthopedic building, um, uh, a new condo complex going up on Hope Street. There's a lot of um, development in our town. Um, but it's zoned properly. You know, we, we are about 96% um, non-commercial, non-industrial land in our town, whether it's residential or open space. 96%, so 4% is commercial. We're never gonna be a town that has all these big box stores and has super, super roads running through it and uh, nothing but commercial development. Our commercial development is almost all built out with the exception of the, uh, the gateway complex down, down at the, um, uh, near the highway. It's, um, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a town that we've grown to love. We love the character. We love our char charming downtown. Our village is, is one of the best in the area. And when you go to area towns, they all talk about our boardwalk, our beaches, our cute downtown. It's come back to life in the last 10 years. I was part of that. I was part of the zoning commission and a study that talked about how do we revive downtown. And we did it with restaurants, with people living downtown, pedestrians on the sidewalk, and very unique experiences like, of course, our, our, um, the dance studio, the children's museum, and, um, and many other businesses. Thank you. Wes, you have another 30 seconds to respond to what you heard or, or elaborate further? Yes, uh, this gateway project, Mr. Nickerson, you stood up here two years ago at the same debate and said that that was definitely coming. Well, it's still not here, and we, no one in this town has a definite answer on whether it is gonna come or not. I believe we do need some sort of big commercial revenue to help offset our homeowner taxes in this town and for other people to wanna come in here. Um, is that a question back to me, Paul? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you uh, 30 seconds to respond. Uh, uh, have expectations fallen short with Gateway? Yeah, we, so we have Gateway. It's zoned for commercial development. Uh, the zoning did, uh, d d commission did a fabulous job 15 years ago, and again, I was on zoning back then, of turning that into a commercial development. We can't just go out and build the building ourselves. A developer has to do it. There is some struggle with, with Costco and with the... If we put Costco on that, on that plot of land and didn't develop or improve the roads and the highway around it, it would be miserable. We would never be able to get down Flanders Road or get off the highway. It has to be done right. All right. Thank you. Uh, anything further before we move on, uh, Wes? No, Paul. All right. Thank you. Uh, so the uh, next question goes to Mark. Um, do you see any opportunities for municipal government and the school system to combine administrative services to improve efficiency or reduce costs? No, not administrative services. Not within the town. Uh, 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 regionally, I think we'll go there someday. I think we have to to get out of our economic uh, doom in, in coming from Hartford. I think uh, you know we, we have 169 towns in this in this state, and we all have a superintendent. We all have a, an administrative hierarchy. And I think um, when you look around the country, I know when you look around the country, um, county school systems are the thing. But it's ingrained in us in Connecticut to to protect our own. If I came out today tomorrow and said we're going to combine with Waterford, Montville, and Old Lyme, I think people would be up in arms. We cherish our schools, we love our schools, and we like them just the way they are, but we pay the price for that. Um, will we um, combine services within the town um, government? We could do that through maintenance, buildings and, buildings and maintenance uh, departments, and we're looking to do that. Uh, Wes, you have 90 seconds. Do uh, you see any opportunities for municipal government and the school system to combine administrative or other services to improve efficiency and reduce costs? On the schools, absolutely not. Um, I agree with Mark. I think we should keep those separate. Um, our school system is, the, is one of the best around. I went to this school system. I went from the old Louis B. Haynes to the middle school to the high school. We have some of the best teachers in the state and a great education system. I don't want to see us combine with another town on our school system. As far as our government, yes, I think there is some room for some co consolidation. 
you know, maybe we can look at some of the other buildings that we have in town to try to move things and, and consolidate instead of spending all this money on fuel oil, for example, at multiple buildings, if we can get numerous um, agencies into one building. All right, um, Mark? I'd love to, have to hear two examples. I'll, give it, I'll, give, I'll share the rest of my 30 seconds back to Wes. I don't know where you would combine in town uh, two or three examples of where we can combi combine services, to, to combine departments that would have enough room for that. Well, we do need Wes. some more room at the Senior Center. Maybe we can move Park and Rec up to the Board of, board of Ed. I believe there's some more uh, room up in that building that we can make that happen. Um, even our town hall, maybe there's room for downstairs in the town hall. We move Park and Rec over there. There is some room for some there's consolidation. There's absolutely no room there. Please. Absolutely no room. All right, with that, we'll move to another question. Uh, and that goes uh, back to, to Wes. Uh, the, the first selectman has appointing authority for several boards and commissions. What would be your approach in making appointments to fill vacancies on the various boards and commissions? Um, and would criticism of your administration uh, disqualify potential applicants for openings? I would do what I always do in life. I'd look at their backgrounds, look at their qualifications. I hold no prejudices. I would appoint people on what they should be appointed for and what their qualities are and what job they can do. I would want to hire the people that could do the best job, the best job for the town. Uh, Paul, could you re Mark, repeat the question, please? In filling vacancy on the various boards and commissions, oh, okay. uh, what would be your approach in making those appointments? And would criticism of your administration disqualify a potential applicant for an opening? Um, the first selectman doesn't make those appointments, first of all. Uh, the board of selectmen does. So we work as a team on November, see the election's on November 7th, so on November 8th, we're all gonna be on one team. It's gonna be Team East Lime, we're all working for the best. And uh, there's, there's six votes on the board of selectmen who will choose vacancies in this town. But as, as first selectman, you do have you know, influence in that discussion. And I have a vote. And when you're evaluating, you know, what, what do you take into consideration? And uh, is people being on board with your vision as first selectman if reelected, you know, how much of a fact would that play in those discussions with the board of I selectmen? think they have to have, first of all, background is important, and resume, especially if they're new coming in, that it has to be an applicable experience um, um, to that position. But if they've been on the board for a while, as long as their voting has been in the best interest of East Lyme, has been uh, in, in places where they, they have the town at heart, I have no problem with that at all. Uh, Wes? I agree, like I said, as long as they're, they're qualified for the position, I would vote whoever can do, a, do the job the best. That's the job that they're, we're putting them forward to do. I would have no, uh, no prejudice against anyone. And I don't think me running would have any issues with them wanting to work with me. I will work with anybody. All right, thank you. Uh, next question uh, begins with Mark. Uh, given the state's continuing budget problems, what should be East Lyme's approach toward preparing for future reductions in state aid? You have 60 seconds. Ah. <laughs> 60 minutes, I wouldn't cover it. We need to, um, we need to live within our own means. Um, we, we receive nine million dollars of state aid and that's gone down a little bit this year but we got through it with about a four hundred and thirty five thousand dollar cut to that state aid but we know it's coming we know over the next ten years we should expect to lose at least a half a million dollars a year that will cut into the quality of schools that will cut into the quality the quality of life in our town and in our town services we have, uh, we'll need to find more efficiencies, more opportunities for regionalization. The last thing we want to do is raise taxes. We don't want to make property values uh, go down because the taxes go up, but we also don't want to lose the quality of our schools. So there's a balance. We're always talking about balance at the town hall on all boards and commissions, but especially at Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen. Uh, Wes, you have 90 seconds. And again, given the state's continuing budget problems, what should East Lyme be doing to approach the potential for further reductions in state aid? Well, thank goodness that the state, our early projections, we didn't lose as much as we were going to. That would have been a big, big issue in this town. 
and I believe, Mark, we actually lost a little bit less, which is good, $419,024 cut from our state budget. But what's a couple thousand dollars? Not a big deal. Um, what should we do? We need to stop spending our money on wants and focus on the needs of the town. We spend a lot of money on certain teams' wants in this town. We need to focus on our needs, the needs of all the people in this town. If we can get our spending under control, we, can, we, we should be able to handle you know, these physical, physical um, crisis from the, phys uh, excuse me, physical crisis from the state and our shortfalls from the state. And we would be able to absorb that without hurting the taxpayer's pocket. Um, before I give uh, Mark another chance, I gotta ask you, could you point out some things you think are, are wants and, and, and are really beginning getting priority over needs? Sure, I got a, I got a great example. Downtown Niantic, that gas station we tore down. Yes, it was an eyesore, but we spent, it's gonna cost in the end about $300,000 on that project. If you drive right down the road, we need some new sewer pumps right next to Dad's, the Niantic pump station. That's about a $300,000 project. To me, that's more of a need than tearing down a, a gas station so we can have a couple park benches and a few more parking spots. I'll give uh, Mark a minute to respond to that, with the, what, how I, you I see I guess I parties. should respond directly to that want versus need. Uh, the water and sewer department runs separately from our town. Although the town runs the water and sewer department, it's not a town agency in that all the taxpayers don't buy into it. So when a pump is, is fixed or rebuilt, as it will be done down at Niantic Pump Station, it's, it's paid for by the rate payers. The, the, the park downtown, the mobile station, was purchased after a referendum with 73% of the town population voted in favor of buying that. And 15 years ago, I sat on a commission that said that's the number one spot in downtown Niantic that the town should control to beautify our town and to make a statement of our town. It's the cornerstone of our main street. And we, uh, and the townspeople agreed and agreed to spend a lot of money on that spot. We're going to beautify that, that property. Uh, we'll be selling granite blocks, but we also have money left over from the purchase. And, um, and we also have some grant money. It will not come out of the operation, operating funds. Uh, give you another 30 uh, seconds, Wes. Uh. Mark, it always falls back on the taxpayer. The taxpayers eventually pay for everything. And the taxpayers are going to get hit with our infrastructure upgrades, no matter how you look at it, whether it's paid for by water and sewer, the rate payer or not, the taxpayer is the one that's going to suffer. But it would be illegal to use tax money to, to fix the Niantic pump station. I know you don't understand that yet, but well, um, it, you can't it, use tax money for that. It has, to be, it has to be water and sewer money. I have to give you uh, another 30 seconds if you want to respond, Wes. Mark, you're a pro. You got all this experience in the town. I'm just yes, a I beginner do. and I'm learning on the job, but yes, you know you what? Are. I'll find my answers. And in, in the end, the taxpayer suffers on all unnecessary decisions. All right, let's uh, move on to another question. It's, uh, we'll go to Mark. Um, Mark, are you satisfied with the progress that has been made to assure the protection of Osaguachi Hills from development? And what has become of the plan to find a new development site uh, in order to end the development fight that continues to take place there? It'll take another hour. I am satisfied with the progress so far because for 15 years, um, a developer has been trying to put thousands, well, uh, hundreds, so 1,400 to 1,700 housing units on that hill, and there's not one up there right now. Um, so I am satisfied with the progress in the protection. Um, I am in negotiation with the, with the developer and on a buyout number. It's too high, but there are, there are, there are, there's money out there. There's grant money. There's, there's, there's organizations that pay for open space and we're working with them and lastly the MOU that we signed to try to trade federal or state land with with um, uh, in order to save that land that's ongoing we struck out with feds uh, we met with uh, Senator Blumenthal and the process for federal land being given away is uh, is a non-starter and frankly the state has just been a little too busy to to worry about little old East Lyme and Osugachi Hills but I suspect there's some state land out there and someday we'll make a we'll make a deal uh, Wes uh, uh, your comment about the progress that has been made to protect the Osugachi Hills from development again I agree Mark I uh 
of anybody in this room. I grew up on that river since so I was in diapers, big, big avid boaters and on that Niantic River. I don't want to see houses or any kind of construction up on top of Asagachi Hills. It's going to have a major effect on our river and it's a, it would be an eyesore. That's some pristine land we have. I hike there. People hike there. I've, I grew up in those woods. I do not want to see any development up there. I think if we can come to some sort of agreement with the developer on a price that's fair for both of us, it should be done and we preserve that forever. Uh, Mark? 15 years ago as chairman of zoning and, uh, and had the first application for the, uh, for the development of Oswegatchi Hills. I'm proud of the work that the zoning commission did, uh, myself as the chair, for several applications. It's the number one issue in this town uh, is, this, is, is saving Oswegatchi Hills. When you think about what it would do to the river, to our housing, to the population boom that would happen, um, whether you live at the tip of the town or all the way down at Old Black Point, this is a very important issue that we preserve Oswegatchi Hills. Um, on rebuttal, Wes, is there uh, anything you've looked at that you would do different, a new approach you might be thinking of? Uh, anything the town might think about if you were uh, in that chair and you were the first selectman uh, with this important issue? What I would do is look in with that developer and like I said, come to an agreement that would be best for him and for the town. And also let the town be a little bit more informed exactly on what's going on with that and where we stand and what the developer is looking for versus what we're offering. Can I, can I, we, yeah, briefly we, we do inform the public. Um, uh, I'm a member of the Oswegatchie Na Nature Preserve and Save the River, Save the Hills. They meet regularly. They are hands-on. God bless these people. I mean, if there's anyone that deserves credit for the saving of Oswegatchie Hills and the postponement of, of the pro progress up there, of development, it's those folks. And, and those folks, uh, we meet regularly and do inform where we are. We can't let people know what negotiations we're in. That's a real estate negotiation. But we certainly inform the public. Thank you. Uh, next question goes to uh, Wes, uh, and it, it, this question has been asked at a couple of our, our debates. Um, I've had s uh, several emails from voters who want to know whether the candidates support President Trump and his agenda. So, you know, and I've asked some of these occasions, why would that matter in a local election? And, and they, what they respond is they cannot vote for anyone who backs uh, President Trump. So I'm going to, I got the question from readers, and I'm going to ask it. Wes? <laughs> I didn't know we were worried about Washington in our small town of East Lyme right now. But anyway, no, I do not support Mr. Trump and his actions that he's taken against our country. But on the other hand, he was elected our president, and I do show him respect. A lot of people do not show him respect because of things that he does. But if he were to walk in this room, I would salute him as our president of the United States. Uh, and Mark, uh, do you support President Trump and his policies? And what do you say to those voters who say I, that's kind of a bridge they won't cross uh, even in a local election? Yeah. Well, there's, there's all sorts of bridges that you, when you're in politics and, and you might have a viewpoint. At the town level, it's all about town management. It's about experience. It's about running it as close to a business as possible, but, um, but realizing you can't run it like a business. I am so disappointed in, in Donald Trump as a president. He had such a great opportunity. He, 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 he clicked with the voters. He came in with some good ideas. Um, but he's, he's been a disaster so far. And he's been an embarrassment. And frankly, um, yes, I'd salute him. Yes, I, I honor the, the president. I went to see all the presidents at the Coast Guard graduation, Obama and Clinton and, and, and both Bushes. And I, and I saw Trump. Um, so I, I respect the office. But my goodness. Um, what an embarrassment. You need to be a mentor, you need to be a leader as president and as first selectman, and he's not showing that at all. Uh, Wes, do you have 30 seconds if you want to respond any further? Yeah, you need to get his Twitter shut off and let someone else handle that. That's half the problem. You know, that even goes on in our town with our selectmen and Facebook. Shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a point of uh, contention that we should have in our hands. Um, yeah, if we could... No but yes, Mr. Debate. Trump, I would salute him. He is our president, and I respect that. I mean, I don't respect all the things that he does or he says, but as a president, I would give him the respect that he deserves. Um, he just needs some serious help. All right, thank you. Um, so we're going new questions, so 60 seconds, so the person taking the question. And this goes to Mark. Uh, 
What would you say to those voters, Mark, who feel that the first selectman should be working for the town full time and not have other private business interests uh, as you presently do? I think it's a ridiculous point that uh, Wes has brought up. I work full time at the town hall. It's a 60 hour a week job. There's 168 hours in a week. You sleep for about 50 of them. That leaves about 118 hours. Now, I don't work all those hours, but I've, I've elevated three managers at my Geico operations. They, frankly, are making more money, and it's exactly the amount of money that I'm making at the town hall. It goes right into my business. This is a full-time job. I'm at, the, I'm at the desk early in the morning, and meetings run till very late at night. It's seven days a week. Yes, I take time off. Yes, I check in with my business. Yes, I tweak it, but I have great managers, and, um, and I'm not uh, shy to say that. I've, I've put in um, uh, more time in this job than I've ever put in any job, and um, it's such a gratifying opportunity that I wouldn't ever um, not pull in, put in uh, 100%. Um, there you go. Uh, Wes, and he gets 90 seconds uh, as a response. Mark, I got to disagree with you. I don't think you're 100% committed to our town. Um, when I started this, you know, months ago, I drive by the town hall probably three or four times a day. A lot of times I don't see your car there, and I know that doesn't mean you're not working, but there's a lot going on in your life, and running a couple businesses and trying to run a town, it can't happen. Someone's going to suffer, and the people that are going to suffer are going to be the town. I think it was great how you cut your pay $15,000. Not bad, but I'm going to give you an honest probably 30 hours a week in the office. That's $64 an hour. A lot of people would love to run something that what you're in charge of for 64 bucks an hour plus benefits. So you're getting your facts from where? Driving so by, stalking? Is that, are, you, are you finished, Wes? Uh, for, I'm done. You, okay. Oh, you have there are seconds. eight town buildings. There are 22 departments. The job doesn't exist sitting behind a desk pushing paper. I can answer emails by phone. I do it seven days a week. If you've sent me an email on the weekend, I probably answered it on the weekend. This is a full-time job. It, Paul Formica was an outstanding leader in our town. He also ran a restaurant and that we all frequent. And, and what a great leader, what a great mentor, and, um, and, and what a great first selectman he has been. And now our state senator. And he still owns a restaurant. Uh, 30 seconds if you'd like to respond. To I'm not here to argue, argue, Mark, and throw uh, spitballs at each other here. But when I have people come up to me on the campaign trail and they go, I got a good name for you, and I say, what's that? Never there, Nickerson. That alarms me. Wow. Wow. The job doesn't exist behind the desk. I'm at CCM meetings, COG meetings, small, uh, um, uh, Council of Small Towns, uh, that's cost meetings. We're in Hartford. We're giving legislative uh, uh, testimony uh, on the budget. This is not a job you sit behind the desk. That's what the executive secretary Putting is campaign for. signs up on town taxpayer dime? What? Putting campaign signs up on town taxpayer dime? You mean on, on time? So Town taxpayer time? 11.30 in the morning, putting can, campaign sure. signs up? If I worked until 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, is that town taxpayer time? All right, I think we exhausted that one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Facts are facts. Wes, um, should East Lyme be exploring development of a regional police force with Old Lyme, or is that discussion premature given how recently East Lyme became an independent police force? Very premature. I'm glad that we went independently. I think that the police chief should not be the first selectman. That's uh, not something that the first selectman's office should be in charge of. And I think uh, Chief Finkelstein is doing a great job. Um, it's very new, and I think it's way too early to see about regionalizing with Old Lyme. That would spread us very thin. Drive out to Old Lyme to get to their beaches if we sent some, some of our police force over there, and then we had an incident, say, up on Grassy Hill. We don't have the manpower or the equipment to try to do both. And at, right, at this point in time, it's way too premature, and we have to see how everything goes. Uh, Mark? It's a discussion. I have discussions all the time with town leaders about a variety of different things. It's only a discussion, frankly. Second of all, there would be benefits to the town of East Lyme. We'd have better, better beach patrols in the summer, where both our towns uh, grow substantially, if not double. There would be some synergy when, when the highways are shut down and all the traffic comes between our two towns. And frankly, a first selectman shouldn't be 
uh, the chief, and that is the case over in Old Lyme where they don't even have police coverage from, I think, midnight to 8 a.m. So um, it would benefit a sister town. Uh, there's, it's preliminary discussions, and that's all it is. But we have three cops on at any one time, and um, to say that we bring Old Lyme in and all of a sudden we have five cops on at any one time, if there was a major incident, now I have five people ready to go no matter where the, where the problem is. Uh, right now we have three. Um, I want to give, I'm gonna give uh, uh, Mark another 30 seconds and then we'll give it a chance for you to respond, Wes. Could, could you bring us up to date on, on where things have stood since um, uh, first selectman of Old Line, Bonnie Reem Snyder, uh, said that there were some discussions. What, what's been transpiring, if anything, since you know, that first uh, news uh, story on that? Well, first, our chief, um, Finkelstein, is uh, on board with coming up with this and helping our, our discussions out. There's things to talk about, like collective bargaining, of course, the unions, first and foremost. And there's, there's some career guys over in Old Lyme that if they were to become East Lyme cops, we'd have to figure out what to do with their pensions. There's capital costs involved. There's management costs uh, or things to figure out. Um, those are the things we've been talking about. It's capital, it's personnel, and how we could both benefit. Um, Wes, another 30 seconds. Um, is there any harm in talking and exploring it? No harm in talking and exploring it, but we need to look at it with a fine-tooth comb. Um, in our current uh, economical state, we got to be very careful on where we're going to allocate funds and make sure that it's not going to hurt the town trying to combine and help out Old Lyme. All right, uh, another question to, uh, to Mark. Um, what role, if any, do you see for local government in combating the opioid crisis? It's hitting home. It, it, it happens here. I had a forum in this room with about six or eight um, uh, people, doctors, policemen, two mothers, one who lost her son, one whose son is an active addict. Um, and we had an opioid forum here. I I think that was 24 months ago, um, uh, or much less, 18 months ago. Um, it's an educational process. I sit on the youth council, and we, we raise money, like the basketball game we had in the gym, to raise money to bring great speakers in to our youth. Um, we, we had Chris Heron, uh, ex-basketball star, Wes, you, you know him, and he was an, he's an addict. And he spoke in the center of the court in the basketball gym, and every student was there and you could hear a pin drop for a full hour. It was amazing. We have a uh, responsibility to educate. We have a responsibility to make sure our first responders are well equipped with Narcan. And, um, and we, have a, we have a responsibility to, get, to support those people who need support. Uh, Wes, same question. Our president has now declared a national emergency. Do you see any role for local government in dealing with this crisis? Yes, it is a very, very important subject right now going on in everywhere and everyone I'm sure in this room knows somebody somehow that has suffered um, from being an addict. It's everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're in small town East Lyme or big old New York City. Um, I have classmates of mine that have passed away from overdoses. I have friends, family, other people that I know that have relatives that have opiate issues. It's a major, major concern. And I think until we get more of our legal system to try to get these harsher penalties enforced to try to stop the opioid crisis, it's not going to get any better. And the people that need help, they deserve help. We should definitely help them. Mark, anything further? You know, uh, we have, just for the record, uh, we, we have six saves this year um, in East Lyme. Six people who were dead who were given Narcan and brought back to life. It's, it is on our main street. It's on, in, I say main street, it's on, on our streets in East Lyme. It is a real problem, um, and, I, and I, I hope the president's um, new war on drugs and focus um, um, it takes hold. It, it certainly needs to happen throughout the country and right here in East Lyme, too. You know, I think it's the juxtaposition that we're talking about typical town issues, but certainly that is one that's been thrust upon uh, all communities, so uh, kind of doesn't fit in, but yet it's the reality we're facing. Uh, Mortar, a common issue dealing with towns, this one particularly, and this question to Wes, uh, to begin our next round, 
what is what would be your long-term vision for the Ni Niantic area if elected first selectman? My long-term vision for the Niantic and East Lyme area would be to make it so my daughter, and hopefully if I have another child, they can live and grow here just as I have. A lot of my friends and classmates and relatives, they couldn't afford to live here anymore. They moved on. I don't, I don't want to leave this town. I've been here since I was born. I want everyone in my family and my close family to be able to stay here and enjoy the great town of East Lyme. Yes, our boardwalk is great. Our beaches are great. Our town is great, but I want to be able to be able to afford to live here as well. And I hope that I, if, if elected, I can get the path um, so that can happen. And any particulars? Uh, we could still work within that 90 seconds. We had time. A any particulars on what a town might do to provide that affordable housing? Um, keep our taxes as, as low as possible and, and keep our, uh, our schools as top notch as they are right now. You know, that, that brings people in here and that will keep people in here um, when they know your son or daughter is going to get a great education and you're not going to pay a lot in taxes but get great services. That will keep people in this town. Um, uh, Mark, shifting back to the, uh, the question, uh, what is your long-term vision uh, for the Niantic area if uh, re-elected for a selectman? More of the same. More of the same. Uh, Wes just described a, a beautiful town, a town that we live in, that we love, that we cherish, that we choose to live in. We all can pack up and move. But we choose to be here. You can choose to be engaged in the, in the future of East Lyme just by coming here tonight or watching at home. Um, the the long-term vision is to keep this, uh, zoning controls the character of our town. Um, uh, policies and procedures by the Board of Selectmen have been solid over the years to watch over our town. This is a great town and let's just keep it that way. Our village of Niantic will always remain that village, that small village. And there'll be growth and there'll be revital revitalization and rebirth, but it's going to remain charming down there. And this area, near the highway especially, are, is poised for growth, for a big box and development, and, um, and it's a highway district. But it doesn't take away from our great neighborhoods, our, our great neighborhoods, our cul-de-sacs and our beach neighborhoods, and our great, charming downtown. Uh, Wes, you could another 30 seconds. You want to elaborate or respond? Yeah. Um, you know, you, like you said, Mark, zoning is in control. But on the other side of that, you know, it's just the, some, it's more about sometimes in this town who you know rather than what you know. The rules aren't the same for everybody, and that's, that's not fair either. Zoning does a great job, but some people can get away with a lot more than others. Uh, Mark, you want to respond to yeah, that? Yeah, that's a slanderous statement. Uh, there is seconds. code. There is code. There are regulations. I'm sorry? I don't think it's slanderous. Well, saying that some people get favors and some people don't, that's slanderous and it lacks okay. integrity. Well, let him you know, respond and then you yeah. can characterize as you see fit. Uh, there are regulations. Seconds. Buildings are built by code, by regulation. And um, those that, listen, there's a way to come down and approach the building department. There's a way to come down and approach with your engineers, with the drawings properly done and say, this is what we want to build. Does it work? And they apply the zoning to that, to, that, to that plan. They apply the building code to that plan. And um, we have beautiful buildings being built, big ones, orthopedic uh, partners, the dental office uh, down the street, big projects, and, and lots of little ones that, that happen every day. Uh, Wes, you know, any examples or things that concerned you or you felt wasn't uh, Yeah, I mean, I went through this personally. Uh, my parents' home burned down from a fire. And, uh, you know, like you said, your approach, I went in there with the greatest approach. Tell me what I got to do. But you get met at that door with a, with a brick. And uh, the people in some of those departments are down outright mean to people. It's not a place of help. It's more of a place of a strain. I have to respond to that, Paul. Yeah, uh, so, give you so at least 30 seconds. I, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, your particular building, I, I hate to bring up the personal stuff, but, you know, there, there was um, an illegal apartment at that building. Uh, that we had to deal with first and foremost. The plans came back incomplete. And when I tried to meet with your grandfather, Ron Rando, um, he shouldn't, he shouldn't, he, well, you just, it did. Well, the issue was raised, sir. sir. 
So, so the issue was raised. So when we were supposed to have a meeting, Ron, you sh didn't show up. I had three engineers at the table and, and the lawyer, and you, you didn't show up, and we were trying to get your building built. I'm not just talking about my building, Mark, and you don't have to bring my stuff up front and center. You did. But first of all, open the my door grandfather away. had no, no uh, means in our rebuilding project. It's not his house. It's our house. And walking into that department down there was nothing but scrutiny from day one. When you file for a building permit in November and it doesn't get given to you until May, that's a problem. It means it was incomplete, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mark, moving on to another question. Your, your uh, opponent raised the issue of concern about uh, children being able to remain here, being able to afford to live in East Lyme. Uh, as the town progresses, sometimes or often, property values uh, go up. That could be a good or a bad thing. Uh, what steps, if any, have you taken, can you take to uh, assure there are a, a variety of housing and affordable housing here in your town of East Lyme? There is a variety of housing. Um, and and um, you know, while we built a whole lot of 4,000 square foot uh, co co um, big, big houses in the, in, the, uh, in the 80s and 90s, there's a whole lot of uh, affordable housing as well, especially down the beach communities, um, you know, in, in the middle of the town as well. We also have approved two affordable housing um, developments while I was on zoning, uh, Sea Spray and 38 Hope Street. We talked about, I talked about at the beginning, the balance. So we talk about can, can people afford to live in our town, but we gotta keep the schools good. So we talk about efficiencies, um, marrying uh, departments together to, to find, to save money, and, and doing everything we can to make sure we have balance and affordability in our town. Uh, Wes, you know, you raised the issue of making sure the desire that people be able to afford to, to live here um, do you see the proper balance or anything you would do different if elected to try to uh, provide uh, more affordable housing? Again, Paul, it just goes back to spending our money on needs versus wants and uh, keeping the taxes as low as possible and offering the, the best services that we possibly can. We've got to keep our schools as top-notch as possible. We've got a big project coming up with the elementary schools, which I'm 100% in favor of. Uh, those schools were in disarray when I was there 30 years ago. It's about time we got off, um, off the ground and, and are going to fix them. Um, I, yeah, you got to keep it so I, my daughter or my son someday can be able to live in this town and be able to afford to. And I have a lot of friends that have uh, graduated and tried to come back here and they, they, just can't, they just can't afford it and they go elsewhere. Uh, Mark, you get 30 more seconds. Um, it, it does take money to live in a quality town with quality schools and quality services. Um, we, we have very low, uh, very low mill rate. Our mill rate right now is lower than Waterford's um, and, and several other towns in our immediate area. Montville comes to mind, Griswold, Voluntown. There's, there's, a, whole, there's a whole slew of them that I have on a list here. Uh, we have an affordable town. We're always looking to continue to make it as affordable as possible, but keep the level and the, of excellence as high as possible. Uh, next question goes to uh, Wes. Uh, Wes, um, I, I, throughout these debates, I get emails from dog lovers who towns that don't have dog parks. I guess East Lyme apparently doesn't have a dog park because do not. I got emails from dog lovers saying, when will their town get a dog park like those other towns? So any commitment to providing a dog park if you elect your first election? <laughs> I have a dog. <laughs> She does not go on the boardwalk or Thank the you. beach. Thank you. Yes, we have uh, plans in the works from what I hear to get a dog park and there's money being raised uh, outside town's funds to, uh, to build one and I would be in favor of a dog park. Um, I don't see a problem with that. Somewhere you can actually go and let your dog uh, get loose a little bit and ha have some fun and have a designated spot in the town for that to happen. Mark, can we get a dog park? Yeah, we, we've been working on it for quite a while. Um, and we, we tried a couple different locations already, ran into some snags with some uh, deed restrictions, etc. But we think we have had to have a spot, and it might end up being at the Darrow Pond um, uh, open space area that we have up at the top of the hill there. That it's town land that we already own. We have a group of citizens who are raising money right now 
look them up, Friends of East Lyme Dog Park, I think, on Facebook, and we could use your money. Uh, it will cost $30,000 or more to put the fencing up and put the, do the proper things to build uh, this dog park. It is the a sign of a quality town to offer this. It's kind of the new thing uh, to offer dog parks. It's a social thing for the owners and, of course, for the dogs as well. Uh, looking forward to uh, seeing that come to fruition, hopefully in the next year. Wes, you get the last word on this hotly contested. Uh... <laughs> Again, I would be in favor of a dog park as long as we uh, can fit it into the budget. Hopefully enough money can be raised where it won't cost the taxpayer anything, which would be great. And as long as we take all the uh, necessary precautions for a dog park, I know there's a lot of liabilities with those, God forbid the dogs fight or God forbid bite someone. <laughs> Okay, uh, next question uh, to Mark, and then Wes will get a shot at this. Uh, name a political leader either currently serving or in the recent past who you admired and whose qualities you feel should be emulated. Um, good question. I, um, I, I, grew, I was in college during the Reagan administration, and um, he had a, 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 just a charm about him. Uh, I'm a Republican, uh, Wes is too, we know that, but um, I, um, th I had a certain affinity for him. I, I recently read a book that, of love letters he wrote to Nancy, um, and it, it, they're touching, and they're, they're soulful, and, um, and I kind of like that part of it. I almost said Kennedy, I was six months old when he died, uh, uh, but I got to live through the Reagan years, and there was a sense of USA pride uh, during that time. Um, and, um, and uh, I think he was a great leader. Uh, Wes, uh, just to repeat the question, name a political leader either uh, currently serving or in the recent past you, who you admired and whose qualities you feel should be emulated. Well, I'm going to go with someone before my time, JFK. Um, he was one from all the readings I've done on him and learned about him in school that could work with anybody and tried to get everyone to come together as one. There was no there was, but there wasn't the Republican versus Democrat like you see today. People want to tear each other apart. He tried to make a cohesive unit, and he got it done. And he was a great family man. Um, it's unfortunate, of, of course, his assassination uh, cut his time in office very short. But uh, he's someone that we should all look up to. All right, thank you. Anything for no, Mark? No, no need to so. about that. Not that type of question. Right. Um, I know it's here uh, somewhere. We've gone through a, uh, a lot of questions. Uh, a couple of the readers just wanted to know um, just basically the, the philosophy and approach you would take the office of first selectman if, if elected. And we give Wes the first shot at that. If elected, first thing I wanted to do, we can't find out where we went wrong um, in the past unless we were to do, in my eyes, phys full physical audit. Find out where we misspent in the past so we can plan ahead for the future. See where we spent our money inefficiently. See where we made some wrong turns. And see where we cannot do those, do those going forward and be better off for the town. Um, I can't predict what the future will hold. Nobody in this room, no, no one in this room can. But if we can see where we went wrong in the past and look ahead to the future, we'll be on a much better path. Uh, Mark, you're there in comment. How would you describe your uh, approach and philosophy to governance? We have 22 department heads in town that are all equally, uh, not equally, some are better than others. I won't name them because some are here tonight. Um, uh, but but, but it's, it's my job to get the best out of the department heads, to inspire, to give opportunities for them to uh, plug in. They're, they're the experts in their field, whether it's parks and rec, or um, it's, 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 it's building, it's, it's public works, it's the highway department. We gotta get the best out of the, our employees, and, um, and then they have to get the best out of their staff. And, and, and my, my style is, is, is of mentoring, is of inspiring, is supporting. Um, we, we, do a fiscal audit constantly. In fact, that's the primary function of the Board of Finance, is, is looking over the finances and making sure we're not spending money incorrectly. Or when there is a mistake made, be called on it and never make that again. That's an ongoing process that already, always and already happens. Uh, anything further on that, that issue, Wes? 
Yes, um, you know, keep the town more, more informed. There's a lot of stuff that goes on behind closed doors in this town that people don't know. Where is your money going? What's going on? I want to have an open door policy. If you want to come in and ask a question and get an answer, you're going to get it. But the town should be more informed on what's going on with their tax dollars and what the town is doing behind these closed doors. You can't get a lot of answers in this town. No one wants to tell you everything because everything is hush-hush. I don't want it that way anymore. I want everybody to know exactly what's going on, and if they want to find out, they can get those answers. I'll, I'll give Mark another 30 yes, seconds because it's got a new issue raised. Uh, yeah, could, could, could I you should know I wanted enough? it. Yeah, hush-hush, yeah. uh, open-door policy. Um, folks, we have public meetings. Um, I know you've been to two, um, and I know you've never served in town government, but we have an open what door does that meeting. Matter? So, is, sorry? There, is there a rule that says you have to serve in, in public government before? Absolutely not. All right. No, Just but asking. experience is necessary for the job, Wes. And, okay. and also showing up to public meetings is necessary to find out what's going on. Showing up to we the have office and working. Website, I'll give you another sorry. opportunity. Thank you, Wes. We have a website that we publish our minutes, and, and frankly, we an I answer calls and emails constantly open door policy about uh, items and then I also refer directly to department heads and allow my department heads, our department heads, to speak to the, to the, the concern that uh, the citizen might have. Well, I promise to give you the last word on that one, Wes. You have 30 seconds rebuttal. Thank you. Yes, um, you know, open door policy and everything, but no, there's not a lot that is open to this, to this town and its town taxpayers. And I've been to more meetings than two. I'm glad to see that you're counting, though. Um, and also, it's easy. Okay. And also, I think that uh, you know, if if everything was so open door, people wouldn't have so many questions, and everything, and there wouldn't be so much hidden agenda in this town that people can't get answers to. All right. Can, with, can I get an example of a hidden agenda? Would I that think be a good we're done here, Paul? Mark. With that, um, we'll move into. We're going to have uh, our final statements. Uh, uh, tonight's debate, uh, as it was mentioned during the debate, will be available on theday.com. Someone's curious, they want to uh, uh, watch it, or if any of you want to rewatch it, make sure you heard what you thought you heard. Uh, it'll be available on theday.com starting tomorrow and right through the election. Also, when we're done here, uh, there's going to be a candidate forum, the, uh, a chance for the candidates uh, running for other offices in East Lyme, a chance to introduce themselves uh, to the voters. So please. Uh, stick around when we're done with that. So uh, the candidates have uh, one minute each for their summations, and we'll begin with Mark. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for putting this on, and if, Paul, and, and moderating, and to the day for putting this on once again. To Tony Sheridan, I know who's here tonight, from the Chamber of Commerce, and to the unsung heroes, the League of Women Voters, and I guess the man of women voters, too, um, who uh, came out and kept time tonight. Thank you for keeping democracy alive in East Lyme. It's my hope that the choice is crystal clear to everyone in the audience and everyone watching at home. Knowing firsthand how things work through experience on various commissions is a necessary requirement of this job. This isn't spring training. This isn't walking into a recruitment office and saying, I want to be the general. Every first selectman in our town's history has risen through the ranks and learned about the town through years of dedication and service. Our greatness didn't happen by accident. Experienced leadership is a secret to East Lyme's success. My heartfelt dedication to serving our town unselfishly and inspiring greatness in department heads, staff, and commission members is my strength. I ask the voters to continue to move this town forward in the right direction. I ask for your vote on November 7th. My name is Mark Nickerson. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Wes, one minute. Thank you all for coming to our debate tonight. It was an honor to be here and answer the questions that you raised. East Lyme is at a crossroads. In this election, you have a choice. You can either choose to keep the status quo and reelect Mark Nickerson, or you can vote for me, Wes Furman. I will give you everything I have to make East Lyme the best town it can be. I know that this, I know that this position is more than a full-time job. It has to be in order to be successful. The townspeople of East Lyme deserve a leader who will work solely for them rather than someone trying to work a dual professional life. The townspeople will ultimately suffer at the expense of the other. I have too much respect for this position and too much regard for the people who would afford me the opportunity to be their first selectman, to not to devote myself entirely to this awesome responsibility. This is a big part of our current dilemma, the lack of a solid plan and leadership to deal with the current physical crisis that our state and region are in. It's no one person's fault that our economy is in the condition it is. 
but it is our fault that we do not have a proper plan in place to overcome it. We need to realize and deal with the current reality that we are in and not on speculations. The town in the past has demonstrated a gross disrespect with its taxpayers. The plan can no longer be to always raise taxes to offset our shortfalls. We raising taxes. Wrap up, Wes, because. Raising time. taxes should always be the last resort. Play the hand that you're dealt. If we can accomplish this and get back to focusing on our needs rather than our wants, East Line will be a better place for all. Please put your trust in me and vote for me, Wes Furman, on November 7th. Once all right, thank you. Ballot. If we could applaud both candidates willing to run for office.